In the Western world, kids grow up listening to strange stories, and some of them are based on myths and legends that have origins in very ancient, long-forgotten times. One of those stories is about a monster with the body of a man and the head of a bull who lived in a labyrinth built with one purpose, to contain his wrath. But to keep him satiated, every seven years Athenians had to send a tribute in blood. Seven virgin girls and seven virgin boys were left to roam the labyrinth until they met their grisly end at the hands of the beast. According to the legend, this horrific sacrifice kept going until a hero named Theseus came and freed Athens from this debt in blood. No one in their right mind would ever think that any of this could possibly be real. But if history has taught us anything, it's that myths are created from events that happened ages ago. Let us find out if at least parts of this story could be real. Remember how Heinrich Schliemann proved that the story of the Trojan War was based on reality? He showed us that sometimes, myths are more real than we could ever imagine. Now, get ready to embark on a new adventure. We are about to discover the secret of the labyrinth, the Minotaur, and a lost civilization that worshipped the bull and ruled the Aegean Sea for thousands of years. For some reason, this ancient civilization was buried and lay hidden on a Greek island for over three millennia and it remained hidden until one curious archaeologist stumbled upon some strange ruins. It was time for the bull worshippers to step back into history. I remember when I first heard about the Minoan civilization and started researching them. The story about this ancient, Bronze Age mystery and how it was discovered blew me away. It was like a question wrapped inside a puzzle, hidden in a maze. The Minotaur's maze, that is. Before we get into the discovery of the Minoan civilization, we have to understand why this discovery changed everything. During the Age of Renaissance, there was a rebirth of interest in the classical works of art, most of which originated in ancient Greece and Rome. And, for the longest time, classical Greece was considered to be the cradle of European civilization, because of all the wonderful works of art that originated in the time of the ancient Greeks. Experts rejected theories that there could have been advanced civilizations in Greece that predated the classical period, but they were all wrong. Then came Arthur Evans. Evans was born in 1851, at the dawn of a scientific revolution that was rapidly changing the world. He was lucky enough to be born to a millionaire and pioneer archaeologist. By his 30s, Arthur was a renowned scholar, as well as a daring adventurist. In 1882, he found himself in a jail in Bosnia, which was then under Austrian rule. He was supposedly helping radicals who were trying to free their country from the grip of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You can imagine such a man would have been pretty bored being back in Oxford. So he decided to go on another adventure. There were some recent discoveries in Greece, so he decided to have a look for himself. Little did he know that these finds would change everything. Can you guess which discovery I am talking about? Yep, it was the year when Heinrich Schliemann found the ancient city of Troy. Hearing of Schliemann's excavations at Hisarlik and Mycenae, Evans rushed to Greece to have a look for himself and talk to Schliemann. He had no way of knowing that his endeavor was to make a significant detour to an obscure Greek island. There, he was about to confirm yet another myth from ancient Greece. The myth of the Minotaur. After Schliemann discovered Troy, he helped excavate the city of Mycenae. The Mycenaeans were basically the guys that defeated the Trojans, led by their fabled king Agamemnon. Excavations at Mycenae yielded priceless treasures, worthy of Agamemnon himself. And that is where Evans was headed. Once there, he was puzzled at what he found. It turned out that before the ancient Greek civilization, as we knew it, there was another, much older one. Evans wondered who were those people, as very little was known about them. But there was one thing he was certain of. Such an advanced civilization had to have been literate. He knew that there had existed written traces somewhere. All he had to do now was find it. Evans set up a meeting with Schliemann in Athens. As he was looking at various artifacts found at Mycenae, one particular artifact puzzled him. It was a golden ring with an octopus emblem on it. This was very strange. Mycenae was landlocked. Why would it use an octopus as a symbol? For several years, Evans went back to Greece. He would search for ancient pottery fragments near the Acropolis and frequent local markets in an attempt to find hidden treasures. One day, a chance encounter at a local market changed the trajectory of his research. He found a merchant selling stones that had engravings eerily similar to the octopus on the golden ring he had seen earlier. When he asked where they were from, the seller pointed him to an island 200 miles from Greece's mainland, the island of Crete. Crete was also mentioned in Homer's poems, 
The poet described it as a beautiful island, washed by the sea and the sun. He said its capital was the city of Knossos, where King Minos ruled in council with the almighty god Zeus. Now, Zeus was a mischievous god. The legend says that he disguised himself as a bull, and had intercourse with a beautiful woman called Europa. Europa had three sons, the eldest of which was Minos, the future king of Crete. In March 1894, Evans set foot on the island for the first time. His meeting with destiny was about to take place. It won't be easy though, due to the conflict between the ruling Muslims and the Christian majority. Not long after he arrived, he noticed the women wearing lucky charms on their necks. They were almost identical to the engraved stones he found in the Athenian market. Evans was enthralled by the artistry and craftsmanship of the stones. Following tips from Homer, as well as the locals, he came about a grassy plain, where supposedly once stood Knossos. Evans didn't want to take any chances. He knew that in order to secure safe excavations, he would need to purchase the land he was standing on. The haggling had begun and lasted for six long years, but his efforts were about to be derailed. His wife had passed away, and Crete was thrown into a violent civil war. The fate of his excavations was hanging by a thread. Once the war was over, Evans continued bargaining for the land and managed to purchase it in 1900. He decided to enlist Duncan Mackenzie to supervise the dig. Mackenzie was a reputable archaeologist at the time. Evans offered him 60 pounds and all expenses paid for a four-month job. What started as a one-time offer grew into a partnership that would last for 30 years. The dig officially started on March 23, 1900, and within just a few days, it was clear that history was about to change. Arthur Evans managed to find a lost civilization, older than classical Greece. Although the Mycenaeans were undoubtedly Greek, what Evans found in Knossos was neither Greek nor Roman. It was a civilization that existed much earlier than any of those, and no one knew their name. After just two weeks, Evans and his workers were gazing upon the face which lay hidden for three and a half thousand years. But none of it would be possible without the help of Mackenzie. Because I don't think Evans really had a great deal of knowledge about the practicalities of field excavation and how one has to excavate carefully layer by layer in order to determine the chronology of what one is digging. And so uh, Mackenzie's contribution to the excavations here at Knossos was absolutely crucial. Mackenzie determined that this civilization was at least 5,000 years old and that they probably ruled until 1400 BC. Then, for reasons unknown, it vanished, like it never existed, except in myth. But now, Evans had discovered the royal palace of this forgotten kingdom. Since the legend says they were ruled by King Minos, he called them the Minoans. And on April 13th, he entered Minos's throne room and found the oldest throne in Europe almost intact. The reimagined palace at Knossos is breathtaking, and Evans would spend most of his life trying to bring this amazing civilization back to life. Amazingly, lively works of art were salvaged, most notably, the frescoes. One of the most puzzling frescoes is the so-called bull leaping scene. It depicts a young man leaping over a ferocious bull. The bull was a symbol of virility and power, and depictions of bulls are found throughout Knossos. Another figure that stands out is the goddess of the snakes. But where was the Minotaur? Deeper in the palace, Evans found strange chambers. He concluded they must have been a prison, and Knossos was huge. There were 1,400 separate rooms, sprawling over six acres. That's enough to put even Buckingham Palace to shame. So, for a prisoner being held in the cold dungeon below, this place must have looked like a labyrinth. It isn't far-fetched to say that the sounds from those dungeons echoed through millennia in the form of a myth. And the monster in that myth had the face of a bull. This is what Evans said about the labyrinth. There can be little remaining doubt that this huge building with its maze of corridors and tortuous passages, its medley of small chambers, its long succession of magazines with their blind endings, was in fact the labyrinth for the Minotaur of grisly fame. It became obvious that the myth of the Minotaur was at least somewhat based on real events. The conclusion was that the Minoans probably held sway over most of the Aegean Sea, with the help of their mighty navy. The cities they conquered were forced to pay tribute, hence the story of the Athenian virgins being sacrificed to the Minotaur. To the conquered cities, the bull-worshipping Minoans were like a monster that was taking their livelihood away. 
While their tributaries trembled, the Minoan culture thrived. Amazingly, the Palace of Knossos had running water and a sewage system, 1500 years before the Romans. Most people in Evan's time didn't have such privilege. But, do you remember what else Evans was looking for? He was looking for proof of literacy, and he found it, although probably not in the way he expected. Evans realized he had found three different types of script. He dubbed them Linear A, Linear B, and Cretan hieroglyphs. The trickiest part of all was deciphering them. As we can see, Evans's quest was far from over. And, although he was about to be disrupted by World War I, he did not quit. And neither will we. Join me next time, when we go deeper into the mythology of the Minoans. We will attempt to uncover how the Minotaur was born, who built the labyrinth and why, were Minoans in fact Atlanteans, and did Evans manage to read the tablets he had found. If you want to learn more about the Minoans, check out these amazing books by clicking the link in the description, and support Lost History TV without any additional cost to you.